In the United States, the Democratic and Republican Party use, respectively, the image of the donkey and elephant as their mascots. The symbols were first used, and to a great extent, by political cartoonist Thomas Nast. In 1870, Nast satirized the Democrats in the North as donkeys after the American Civil War. Four years later, in 1874, Nast chose a fallen elephant to represent the Republican electorate being dissatisfied with Republican President Ulysses Grant. Cartoon images of the donkey and elephant were then repeatedly applied to the political battles between the Democratic and Republican parties, reinforcing these deep-rooted caricatures. The donkey and elephant are classic devices used in such caricatures. They also represent the function of early cartoons, illustrating a humorous picture using defamation, analogy and symbolism to portray satire or praise. In the 19th century, France was the comic center of the world. La Caricature, the world's first cartoon magazine, was published there in 1830. Comics quickly became popular throughout Europe, with the center gradually shifting from France to Britain. In the 20th century, British comics enjoyed greater publication, with most being early caricatures. Some comics were published continuously in tabloid newspapers and magazines. During this period, the drawings of British cartoonist Aubrey Beardsley were not only witty and bizarre, but also paid significant attention to the social problems of the time, especially inequality during the Victorian era. From the illustrations he created for Oscar Wilde's play Salome, Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock, and Leonard Smithers' periodical The Savoy, from 1895 to 1898, contrasting smooth lines in black and white are often seen. This breaks a picture's balance, and it also creates conflict through detail, and pursues an often bizarre, morbid, and even sexy form. Sadly, Beardsley died at the age of just 26, but he left behind a large number of works which are both delicate and full of vitality. In the 19th century, caricature as an art form blossomed and it naturally developed further a century later. Before World War II, Caricatures were a prominent phenomenon throughout the world. During this period, the most typical European comics were still from Britain. Carruthers Gould was a British cartoonist who struggled against the policies of the South African Conservative government. Gould usually directed his attacks against the colonial minister, Joseph Chamberlain. Over 100 cartoons depicting Chamberlain are full of irony, not only regarding the man himself, but also 
the history of British imperialism. American political caricatures in the 1970s were still mainly based on the Cold War. In the late 1970s, the Cold War was entering a new phase, and political caricatures became the best non-violent means to attack the enemy. One example was the Soviet Union consumed Estonian food production. It's considered a classic political cartoon of the era. In some caricatures, Western cartoonists enjoyed depicting powerful figures in humorous fashion, while also expressing their expectations or discontent through humorous exaggeration. Under the pen of contemporary English cartoonists, Prime Minister Tony Blair's image was constantly changing. From Bambi, an innocent and lively form with big eyes, to the devil, reflecting the political changes during his decade of leadership. Chairman of the British Cartoonists Association, Martin Rawson, believes that when Blair first became a political figure, it wasn't easy to portray him. So Rawson always liked to highlight Tony Blair's teeth. In October 2004 and January 2005, two comic exhibitions about Blair were held in London. When it came to the impact of comics on Blair, Tim Benson, organizer of the political cartoon gallery, quoted former Prime Minister Winston Churchill. He said that when he no longer became the protagonist of cartoons, people would begin to worry about the influence of cartoons. Of course, not all caricatures depicting those in power can appropriately reflect an artist's intention. American cartoonist Mike Marlin discovered this when he compared the Bush budget plan to an aircraft hitting the World Trade Center in New York, symbolizing the impact of the September the 11th attacks. His piece was meant to criticize the fact that President Bush's federal budget did not pay sufficient attention to the issue of social security. But the cartoon caused a great uproar, forcing Marland to make a public apology. Marland realized that more moderate images could also achieve satiric purposes. Edward Sorrell is one of the most famous contemporary satire cartoonists in the United States. For over 10 years, his social criticism, political satire, and unexpected illustrations have created a huge following. Sorrell is sharp-minded, and he has exceptional wisdom and humor, all of which are displayed in his works which contain rare vitality, subtlety, complexity, unpredictability, and comedic elements. They also absorb stories from history and mythology inclusively. In one cartoon he observed, mile high spectacle with suspense on every floor. David Rockefeller gives his usual suave performance as a banker who builds the city's tallest building, only to discover no one wants to rent floor space in it. But, clever plot, his brother turns out to be the governor, and all ends happily when hundreds of state agencies are moved in and the bank cleans up.
regarding the death of Irving Berlin on September the 22nd, 1989, at the age of 101, he wrote, I expect he was warmly received by Bach, Schubert, Mozart and Gershwin in heaven. The angry person in the lower left is Richard Wagner, because he now has to keep company with another Jew. When Richard Nixon ran for governor of California in 1962, his campaign went badly from the very beginning. This was largely because of a secret $200,000 loan from the defense contractor Howard Hughes to Nixon's brother, Donald Nixon, which was no longer a secret. His nerves were already taut when he arrived in San Francisco's Chinatown to do more campaigning, but he nearly became unraveled when he opened a fortune cookie to discover the message what about the Hughes loan? The Godfather passed the torch to the younger Godfather without mentioning loan sharking or other illegal activities. If such criminality was shown in the film, then the Italian community in America might protest about racial stereotyping. One time, Luigi Galvani, professor of anatomy in Bologna, Italy, accidentally touched a static machine with a knife and then a dissected frog, and he saw the frog muscle responding to electricity. Galvani was very surprised, and he called the phenomenon animal electricity. Of course, this concept has been proved to be incorrect, but people still commonly use the term to describe the response to stimulation. They call it galvanization. Today, Western caricatures still play an important role in comics, with their unique artwork gaining popular recognition. With the introduction of European lithography technology to China more than a century ago, the country's publishing industry was able to flourish. China's new emerging middle class founded a large number of newspapers and magazines to promote their own political views. Comics often played a central role, featuring exaggerated artwork, irony and clever criticism of the times. It was getting dark in the autumn rain, and he sailed a boat to see off the tide in Zhejiang. This verse uses a metaphor to expose the crime of the governor of Zhejiang, who secretly executed Chao Jin, a revolutionist at the time. Chao Jin had once written, I was worried in the autumn rain, so the words autumn rain immediately reminded readers of Chiao. The phrase, it was getting dark, implied that the Qing dynasty was about to end. 
Moreover, the name of the governor was hidden in the picture. The rolling river suggested the irreversible tide of revolution. In 1909, the newspaper Shanghai Current Affairs edited and published its Pictorial of the Year. The work included a collection of more than 80 comic caricatures published in the newspaper in 1908. The content focused on the irony of the imperial aggression China was facing and the hideous crimes of treason and the crackdown of the Qing government. Self-deception, two faces, and constitutional investigation are prominent examples. Going by existing data, Pictorial of the Year was the first comic series in the modern history of Chinese comics. In 1911, with the outbreak of the Revolution of 1911, Chinese comics became more active. Chang Lu Guang published a cartoon called Incompetent to satirize Yuan Shikai. Wu <music> Jian Shi published Prime Minister to reveal the treasonous acts of the feudal government. It also exposed the story behind the so-called New Cabinet after the Qing government appointed Yuan Shikai as Prime Minister of the Cabinet. In 1919, Ma Xingqiu published Under Manipulation. This satirized the Japanese imperialists who were manipulating warlord Duan Qi Rui to gain control of Qingdao and Shandong province. In July 1930, the League of Left-Wing Artists was founded. Ye Chen Yu became famous for the publication of Mr. Wang and Chen. Mr. Wang and Chen reflects the circle of life and ideas of ordinary people, while also exposing official corruption. Mr. Wang and Chen was published between the spring of 1928 and the Marco Polo Bridge incident of 1937. It thus covered nearly a decade. It's a fine representative work and it enjoys an important position in the history of Chinese comics. In the 1920s and 30s, Ye Chen Yu became China's most popular cartoonist. In 1945, after the War of Resistance against Japanese aggression, Ding Tong created a new cartoon exposing the malicious robbery by the KMT in the Recovery Zone, committed on the excuse of recovering property from the enemy.
Ding Tong, Miao Yintang, and Fang Chang are considered China's three major contemporary caricaturists. Caricatures in New China didn't have sharp political conflicts. They rather focused on people's lives. Among them is Fang Chang, who through his understanding of various social ills has drawn a large number of popular thought-provoking comics. He was an artist who took great pride in his work. One of his most famous works is Wu Dalang's Restaurant. Through the words of a short waiter, my boss wouldn't hire anyone taller than me, the artist cleverly satirizes the drawbacks of the popular personnel system. It causes people to think while laughing. The couplet on the gate reads, Power rather than the height of a man matters, and I am supreme in my restaurant. The written words, together with visual images, form a delightful contrast, deepening the theme. The use of ink figures on rice paper is Fang Chung's representative style and it explores a national tradition. The profound, unique and sophisticated conception of Fang Chung's representative works, such as Bu Da Lang's restaurant and The Mortals Also Have Defects, has won him many admirers. Later, he devoted himself to researching humour. Fang Chung believes that comical irony should always have an abhorrent subtext, together with a certain sense of humour. He also believes that truly excellent cartoonists should be social critics with an excellent cultural and ideological background. But he says they should not forget that it comes deep from within social life. Cartoonists must have a sense of humour at heart so that they can create works that make people laugh. It's an advanced form of laughter, however, because lying behind it is the social critique that cartoonists devote themselves to. Fierce competition in the American newspaper market generates a new form of comic entertainment which spreads like wildfire around the world. Join us for part three of From Pen to Screen, the comic strip.